Okay, we're going to get started because we have a half hour that goes far, far too fast. And Carmen is going to be in conversation for 20 minutes, and then we're going to have 10 minutes time for questions at the end of it. So just a short introduction, which I'm afraid I'll read because my memory is terrible, especially having just done four sessions on the trot. <laughs> um, Carmen was born in Mexico City in 1954. Her first book was the novel Antes, published in 1989. She is now the author of seven volumes of poetry, including Patria Insomne and Amartya o Acha, 17 novels, two books of essays, and 10 plays, seven of them staged. Lots of things to talk about there. Her work is eclectic, never. Um, what do we call it? It has hybridity of genre, I think we'd say often focusing on the issues of feminism and gender roles within a Latin American context. Her translated works include Their Cows Were Pigs, um, a historical novel set in a buccaneering world of pirates, revolutionaries, and rogues, and Cleopatra Dismounts, a novel offering three versions of the life of Cleopatra. She's lectured at Oxford, Cambridge, Heidelberg, Pi Universität um, in Berlin, Irvine, Brown, UCLA, Lale, Yale, the Library of Congress, the National Museum, Autonomous uh, Museum, University of Mexico, and others. Her novel, La Otra Mana de Lepanto, was accounted by an international survey of the authorities to be among the top works of literature written in Spanish in the last 25 years. Carmen has served as the chief advisor to a major museum exhibition and engaged in the writing and production of a feature film, Las Paredes Hablan, The Wall Speak. An exhibit of some of her art is to be held at the Museo Carillo Gil. In addition, as if uh, there were a lot of spare time left over, you have won five New York Emmy Awards for your magazine program, Nueva York on CUNY TV. That was um, a weekly program, isn't it, that you have done? Okay. Well, let's start at the beginning, because I was remembering and re-remembering um, what works we do have of yours in England, and we had a very interesting experience at the end of the 1980s where I translated a novel of yours, La Milagrosa, which is maybe a miracle worker, it was called in English. Um, probably the nearest of your works that could possibly be tarred with a brush of having some aspects of magical realism included in it. And then I translated another, which was The Cows Wear Pigs, which was spiked when the publisher changed MD and Jonathan Cape decided that was no longer suitable. And then it appeared in the States, and then Leaving Tabasco also appeared. And let's start then with Tabasco and then bring it up to date and talk also particularly about Texas, the great theft, which Samantha Schnee here has translated for you. But Leaving Tabasco is about your background. It's the grandmothers and mother stories. Well, it is not a biographical, autobiographical novel. I compressed uh, two gener three generations of Mexico in the story of a little girl. Uh, and it's an imaginary Tabasco. Uh, it was the moment when all um, young writers started saying they hated magical realism. I don't write magical realism because I'm from another generation and you don't, uh, it's not, I, I, I never, I don't copy what others are doing but I do literary homages. Mm -hmm. So just to go against the wave, I decided to do an, a novel of childhood, a girl brought into adulthood uh, through the literary tastes of the time, from the storytelling that you listen in the kitchen to uh, her youth when they were people around her were, the, were reading Garcia Marquez, uh, to her adulthood where she has taken a distance and she's now reading Lope de Vega and the classics. So it is a literary homage. The original title in Spanish is called Treinta Años, 30 Years. Mm -hmm. The editor decided to call it Live in Tabasco because the girl uh, is born in a little town in, in, in Tabasco and leaves Tabasco. Um, it, it has absolutely nothing to do with my life. 
Uh, I compressed the generation of my grandmother, mine, and, and, and my mother's and mine, but it's not the life of my grandmother nor my mother's that, by the way, are quite interesting, and if I ever write my memoirs, I will talk about my mother being raised in the anti-Catholic Tabasco where the children were taken outside to the patio of the school or to the streets of the schools and then, then made bonfires of images of saints and, and crosses. And it's exactly what Graham Greene saw in Tabasco. That was the, the early childhood of my mother and the childhood of my uncles and my aunts. They burned saints. Uh, my mother, as an adult, when she married my father, became, on the other way around, a fanatic religious. She was, uh, the, when they were young, they were part of the Opus Dei. So they were not only very religious, but very right-wingers. And it, I look at it and I say, well, it, my life, the life of my family has been like a cabaret piece. Mm -hmm. uh, I have my grand-grandparents, the first ones we know about in Mexico, one of them was kidnapped by, par by pirates in the sea. It's true, they are records. Two of my grand-grandparents uh, signed the Declaration of Independence in Mexico. Uh, so I have a family that has gone through all this, um, all this but it, it, when you look how the contrasts between the generations go, it ends being almost a cabaret piece. So my parents were Opus Dei, then they divided from or split from the Opus Dei, and we became a missionary family. We lived in a town where nobody spoke Spanish, an Indian town in La Huasteca in Hidalgo, La Huasteca Hidalguense. We went from little, little village uh, spreading the stories of the saints, the same poor saints that had been burnt in the bonfire. <laughs> now they were going through other process. They were being, their stories were being told. We put we had a jeep, we crossed little rivers, terrible roads, we arrived to the little town where there was no electricity, nobody spoke Spanish. Nevertheless, we, start, we put our records, you remember the black records, we put them on the battery of the jeep, chunk, my sister and me, that was our job, we put that, and my job was to change the slides, they were these uh, filminas, I don't know how you say that in English, they were like rolls, so every Fields. time the record said, eh, mambo, el niño mardir, boom, <laughs> Every poem I had to chunk. So, and I adored the stories of the saints. I, they were for me so fascinating. They, 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 they did miracles. They suffered terrible heroic pains without relief, feeling them. They, there you had Santa Dorotea being chopped into little pieces while she was only thinking of God and singing songs, all in the little slides. So, uh, and spreading that, those stories to this people who did not speak a word of Spanish. So who the hell knows what they were building on their heads with these stories? Mm -hmm. Well, we brought them sandwiches with white bread. Imagine, no, 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 the story is unbelievable. My father worked in the industry, making industrial bread. So in these Indian towns, we went with the, the bread. It, it's a, that's the story. And then my mother died uh, very, very young. So uh, that piece of cabaret stopped being that and started being a tragedy. Uh, but I have all these variety of things in my childhood that I did not, and I did not use in that novel. What I did there was uh, recovering traditions that I deeply appreciated mm -hmm. and playing with a gender or, uh, that was seen in that, that was not trendy in that minute. It was everything but trendy. So I saw her do it. I put her into the whole process of the, of the literary thing. It was, a, it was a literary game. That's what uh, Living Tabasco is. Um, and I, I always go from one novel to the next. It's they, they bounce me into the next uh, adventure. One uh, gives me the possibility to working in another novelistic world with another another uh, construction of the book, another level of language, another um, use of, uh, of, of, of storytelling or, or non-storytelling, because novels are not only about storytelling. No, and you write it across genre in, a, in many, many different ways. And of course, you write a great deal of poetry, too. 
um, and short stories and, and, and many, many different forms. But some of the themes do resurface and, and the miracle worker has something of the story of the saints. So of course, in Mexico, you also burn Judas yes. every year. So yes, the miracle so worker, get, in fact, is a, it's a 20th century saint. Uh, I think it's not magical realism at no. all. That is strictly sainthood. Uh, she's a 20th century saint that that lives in a saint's uh, world. Yes, that's mm -hmm. what I did with the miracle worker in a way, with another focus, an adult eye, uh, but using my, my capital, sometimes more valuable than others. <laughs> sometimes more valuable because my father used to read me in the nights when we were no longer a missionary family, but we were back in our house in a very good barrio of Mexico City. Uh, my father read us all the nights to me and my sisters to put us to sleep. And my two sisters immediately pah, fell asleep. And I was listening to him reading for his own pleasure. He read us El Buscón de Quevedo. He read us the whole Quevedo, the, the, the whole Quixote. He read us poems. He read us the plays of Lope de Vega and did the voice and the rest for his own pleasure. It's what he wanted to do and put us to sleep. And there I was, like my eyes were rolling, mm -hmm. uh, listening to these stories. And of course, the attraction that a father has for a little girl with these very disturbing stories for the conscience mm -hmm. of a little girl, I was attentively listening to him, and I wonder if it's why I am since then uh, uh, an insomniac. I wondered too when you said that, <laughs> yes. But you, I mean, they've come in useful, your family, even if some of the stories were uh, as they were. I mean, the, their cows were pigs, the pigs are the pirates, aren't they? And you've just told us now that pirates featured in your personal life as well. Yes, and the, the Cows and the Pigs, um, I had been writing some novels that I used marginally, historical characters of yes. Mexico. I had uh, worked with Moctezuma in a, a, a revival of Moctezuma yes. in Mexico City. So the next thing was um, the, Caribbean, the, the, the Caribbean Sea, how they arrived. And reading about it and browsing, uh, I found this utopic community of pirates. Yes. And I was interested by it, so I, I started exploring and reading about it. I saw Carpentier calls him the surgeon of the pirates, Esquemelin. Uh, I saw how the memoirs were had been published. I read first what I got into my hands into was a French uh, version of his life, and then I found a Spanish translation that had nothing to do. They were two totally different stories. In the French, the Spanish were evil. In the Spanish, the French were evil. What then I went surprise. into the English, and oh, in the English, oh, Sir, Sir Morgan. And so it was all the characters switched the value from one version to the other one. And first I thought I was going to write the novel about the editor because the editor himself was the translator. It was a business. Mm -hmm. He was doing business redoing mm -hmm. these memoirs. And then I um, decided, um, I suddenly saw the novel. It was my possibility to enter a community where yes. women were forbidden, uh, where private property was forbidden too. So a community that had wonderful values to my eyes, so things that I was very attracted to, and others that I was intrigued, or um, in a way fascinated in a bad way, and that was violence, the violence, they, the, the violence that, that, that appeared in that yes. community. So I, I wrote that novel, I, in fact I wrote uh, three novels on pirates, mm. that was my first, then I wrote um, a second one, that a version for children or for young readers, uh, uh, a watered version to say so of the same story but different, uh, diminishing mm. many things, the literary games, the making it more narrative. And then I wrote a radio play of women pirates because I needed to be among girls <laughs> after being so much time among men. So I wrote this, um, the story of women pirates that you all know, but it was, it was fun and I did it with my the father of my children, uh, my companion mm -hmm. of many years, and he was an actor. It was a way also to bring some money to the house. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So let's leap, because we have so little time. Let's leap to much nearer the present. And in fact, you do go historically even there. The, the book that has just appeared in English, Texas, The Great Theft, translated by Sam Schnee, is indeed about um, something that's 
segues into the present, because the book you did after that, you did with Mike Wallace, your husband now, and that's the story of narco-trafficking. So can you explain a little bit about the connections between the pioneers uh, and the, the Tex-Mex connection, and then about how, at the moment, we seem to be in a world where um, the drugs are mainly going north out of Mexico, but the guns are all coming south out of the States. Because in Mexico, contrary to popular assumption, it is completely illegal for civilians to carry guns, whereas, as we know in the States, everybody has half a dozen. So, how does so that work? Um, very different themes, and we are running away from many decades, which is good, yes. because the Pirates book I wrote like three centuries ago. I think I wrote it when it happened. Uh, and then I wrote many other novels, and one brought me to Texas. Uh, Texas is the frontier in the, the, the recently stolen Texas, the recently torn from Mexico, Texas in 1853, and an incident that created an involuntary hero. Mm -hmm. Juan Epomoceno Cortina became the leader of the Mexicans in the other side. Um, in in an, a fascinating landscape where you had the locals that were Mexicans, immigrants from many countries, because Mexico, the independent Mexico, had done an extraordinary job to make Texas very attractive. So Germans had arrived, Russians had arrived, people from all around the world were there because Texas was the land of the future. You could do, you could, the horses grew alone. You could raise houses doing, uh, cows doing just like this. Water was abundant, the weather was perfect. That's how they, <laughs> Mexico sold it, because we needed more immigrants in that portion, the far north, el lejano norte, uh, to go against the Indians. So I, I was the Indians. Well, we were Indians, but they were the other Indians, the savages, the Apaches. So it, it was a, a thing very important in the imaginary, in the imagination of the of the independent Mexico, mm -hmm. the brand new independent country that looked at the far north as the possibility of them being the conquerors, no longer the defeated, the people who were carrying a wonderful heritage but we had lost our empire in the hands of the Spaniards. But now uh, we were the doers of that new territory over there, and we were conquering the savages, the Comanches, the Apaches, the whatever it is, and the Texans there. So this is the part that has just been stolen. We have all these immigrants, and an incident, and I wrote uh, uh, <sighs> It's a little bit difficult to call novel that novel, but it is a novel. The main character is Texas. There are like 287 characters um, describing the, uh, appearing the scene. We listen them all react towards this incident. The first 200 pages are uh, happening only four minutes. We see a, a gossip spread around and how all people react and the gossip returns and how they are developing their own stories very, very, very fast while the time is frozen. And in the second part, I compressed the six invasions that are factual and historic. Cortina, this guy who was a leader of the Mexicans in the other side, and the first one who called them La Raza. Uh, Cortina um, invaded the United States six times with a Mexican army. So I tell the story of the six invasions of Mexicans to the states compressed only in one war. Uh, that is my Texas novel. I finished it, I think, three years ago or two and a half, but very, very long years. I have very long years. And then I started writing a long uh, book on the, the situation in Mexico that is, uh, that, that, well, obviously it became my obsession because I never imagined Mexico was going to be in this situation. I never imagined I was going to be carrying on my back 100,000 people dead in this stupid war, plus 28,000 disappeared or more, mm -hmm. that we were not going to know their names, that we were not going to, it's, it's a situation I never saw coming. So I wanted to explain it to myself. I did first um, a first effort, 
Uh, Samantha Schnee is, uh, it, is, it knows I did it because she translated it. That first, uh, it was my first oh. draft. Uh, that didn't work, it didn't explain the situation. So I grabbed my poor husband, took him out of his lifetime project. That's the total history of New York. He's a Pulitzer mm -hmm. Prize winner. He wrote a book called Gotham and it's per secula seculorum preparing volume two and volume three. And he's working very <laughs> hard on it and it's so big that it became two volumes, not one, but now he's correcting the second and he's going to the third. But I stole time from him so we could tell the story, an narco history of how the Mexico and the United States jointly created uh, what is called the Mexican drug war. But that is another kind of book, right. uh, has nothing to do with my, um, the development of my novels or my literary work. It was my work as a citizen and my work as a person to try to understand what the hell passed with my beautiful country. And while I was uh, writing that book, I had to I had to continue writing because uh, I I worked uh, double double days every day I couldn't I couldn't afford anymore it was impossible to tolerate all that pain so I I wrote a novel uh, that's uh, I, I reread Tolstoy's Anna Karenina I was like reading again the classics things that had for me something joy for me because because everything work was intolerable life was intolerable everything was difficult and it was very difficult to work with my husband who is adorable I love him I'm madly in love with him but never work with your husbands it was very difficult uh, so I was in the middle of this you might disagree you are a good person I'm not necessarily a good person uh, so it was very difficult and I rereading Anna Karenina I saw that Tolstoy says Anna Karenina wrote a novel and then he forgets about the novel of Anna Karenina and I decided to write the novel and to find it I had to find the manuscript so I wrote a novel where I my characters find the the manuscript and all what happens around it. I have the painting of Anna Karenina, Tolstoy has to appear a minute in the novel, and I, re and I wrote the novel of Anna Karenina in the middle of my novel on how the manuscript appears. Um, so that, that, that is done. Now I have to dream of a new project. Well, I already know which is, but I never say which is my new project because they, they get putrid. If I start speaking of them aloud when I'm working on them, I am always going from one to the other one. Uh, you and should I have pilfered sometimes. But <laughs> if we can pause there just for a moment, maybe there are people who would like to ask you about everything you can talk about and you have been talking about so eloquently till now. Do we want to have questions or would we be happy if Carmen just continues? Yes, apparently. Okay, we. this is... Democracy in action. I mean, you, you have the floor, but if you don't want the floor, you can hand it back again. <laughs> Would anyone like to chip in? No, come on then, keep, keep going. Okay, so I don't know what's going to be next. I'm publishing a book of poetry. Uh, well, in fact, I think it's already printed in Iperion in Spain. It's going to be my second book of poetry. Um, my second book of poetry with them, because I normally published mm -hmm. with Fondo de Cultura Económica, but I switched. Um, and I, well, uh, I need money for many reasons, so they offered me if I could write uh, 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 an idea for a movie, which I've done other times also, uh, for the same horrible situation, uh, because it would be great not to think of, I need to earn money, I need to earn money, what do I do? That, and I stopped teaching. I used to give uh, classes in, I've done, <laughs> give, give, given courses in American universities, but I needed all their air. I stopped doing it. Um, so I, I'm writing, I wrote already a proposal that has been accepted and I cross my fingers and I hope we are going to do a version of the Prince and the Pauper in Mexico today. Oh really? The uh, yes, the, the, the presentation is all done and I've been working with the filmmaker on the script in my spare time. <laughs> in my spare Between time. Between three and five in the morning. More or less, more yes. or less. Thanks to the rigorous education my father gave me on insomnia, I can work through the nights. I know, I've stayed with her, it's true. <laughs> <laughs>
And there's also, beside your bed, there's always several eye bandages, so you can, you know, those things they give you in airlines, so you yes. can actually sleep in pitch darkness. Yes, yes, yes. And I have a temptation, but I've never dared because I'm a woman, and my temptation, I have a collateral passion in life that's uh, food. I love to cook. And it's very bad I say it, but I am a terrific cook. And I think the moment has arrived where I should write something that would be between my memoirs and the kitchen. Tell the story of my family through the kitchen. But my real, real, real family is not my father and my mother and them, but all those authors I adore. So I have selected 37 women authors that I, whose life I'd love to tell while I present the dishes. But I don't think out there because it's so difficult to be a woman writer and love to cook. It doesn't look like, like, like I feel like I want to look. It looks like, I don't know, I don't know, I have a problem, I'm a 70s person. Too, too many miniskirts. Uh, I don't know, it makes me, it puts me in a little bit, but I have that temptation too. But you're a very inventive cook. You're the only cook that's ever made me a soup with the husks of the pineapple. <laughs> um, it was absolutely delicious, but I'd never known what to do with the pineapple skin before, but now I do. Um, but are these yes. 35, sorry, is there a mic? Hi, I'm just really interested in this list of 37 women writers. Yeah. 35. Uh, um, sorry? 35, wasn't it? 37. Yes. Was it 37, sorry? No, no, I, I, I said the 70s. No, I mean, the sorry. women ah, writers. The 37. Ah, the, the 37 are the first one. Yes, is tell Walada. Me, yes, please say as many as you can remember. Yes, quick, quick. We have five minutes. Walada is. Uh, I, I only have two that do not write in Spanish. Uh, the first one is a Mozarabic or Mozarab uh, author, poet, uh, who refused to use veil and embroidered her verses in her clothes, and I very well know what she, I'm going to cook for her, because I'm going to do what Judy Taylor did in the dinner for famous yes. women, uh, that it's in the Brooklyn Museum now hosted, but she has no Hispanic writers, women writers, so I'm, that's how I started thinking of, I'm going to do their table, but I'm not going to do their table in ceramic, because A, I'm not a ceramist, and B, because I'm Mexican, and if I see a table, I want to eat, and if I want to eat, I want to eat something very complicated and very good. So I, I have Walada, I have, of course, Juana Diaz Bajes, or Juana Inés de la Cruz, I have Teresa de Avila, whom I adore, and who wrote, God is in the pots, Dios está en los pucheros. Um, and I go, Silvina Ocampo, obviously, Victoria, she didn't much like to eat, but I have to have her. Elena Garro, who was mad as a hatter, but is a wonderful writer. Um, and the last one is a sad one, and I don't know how I'm going to make her feel some joy with the food. It's a young, young uh, women author of Mexico, of the frontier, Susana Chavez, uh, who is one of the victims of this uh, violence in Mexico today, and who is the one who created the phrase, ni una mas, not one more woman murdered in Ciudad Juarez. She was an activist, and she was, her, her, heads were, her, face, her hands, hands were chopped, you know, all the horrible stories. I'm not going to tell the horrible story, but I'm going to try to recover her life and describe that situation, because with every one of them, I try to, you know, I have the, the woman writer that was called the lover of Zapata, Dolores Jimenez y Rio, who was a very important journalist and a mediocre poet, let's be honest, but she wrote for him his pamphlets and his, uh, his words, and I think her memory has to be kept up, etc. That To say them in five minutes is a little bit difficult. That's very good. Is there one very quick final question? I just, yeah. wanted, I just wanted to very quickly ask you about the cooking thing. You were saying you didn't like, you didn't like the um, way you enjoyed cooking represented itself to you. Is that because you feel it's, it also represents oppression of women in the household? It's a very difficult... Uh, I, I understand for younger women like you, it's not... Uh, it's not a cause. When I was a little girl, I was watching my grandmother cook and I was fascinated by it and I learned to do a lot of things. 
uh, from tamales to chocolate by hand and things like a little girl helping in the kitchen. I loved it. But my mother, when she split from the Opus Dei and went to live to an Indian town and started going to the leftist church, considered cooking completely for women that were in their houses. And as I liberated myself from the death of my mother that was very difficult, from my non-school that was very difficult, from my social class that was very difficult, and from all that was expected from me. I had, I wanted, I, even though the moment I had my own, I, I lived with somebody and I had a stove to cook, I started cooking. But I didn't want anything to do with that, with the role of a woman, never. I married for the first time at 50 years old, though I have children of 30 and some. But I didn't want any traditional role of a woman. I wanted to do it, uh, no Kuchen, Kirche, Kinder. I wanted something. My first play was uh, this, the statement that women authors should not have children. And then one day I realized I needed a daughter, and luckily I have two. I adore them. I have a grandson. It's fun. Uh, but I had this attitude. And, and with cooking, I still have my reservations. It's difficult, but I'm going to do it because I, that's going to be for me a conquest. It's going to be a conquest. It's very important. Cooking is for me very important. I daily cook, not only for whoever lives with me, but all the victims I find. I do big parties, I cook, and I, sometimes I have sold food because one is always, I don't write the sellers. Uh, and and I, one always needs money, so I, I love cooking. Um, and I don't want a restaurant because I have had already a theater bar, <laughs> a theater <laughs> restaurant, but I restaurant. don't want that slavery. So <laughs> maybe I'm going to do that. Okay, thank you That's all very much. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. That's lovely.